Good morning. Ah, if I wait, it does work. My fault. <laughs> Please turn with me to Psalm 109 as we look at the subject this morning. David had a bad day. <laughs> and if you've ever read through this psalm, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We went through it in the young adults class, and it was an awkward read, was it not? <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's talking about a whole lot of things that aren't necessarily making David look like the happiest camper, which caused us to basically look at a single question. <laughs> what could bring David to this point? What would bring David to this point? I see sometimes I eisegete or read into David's experience like I do the rest of life. I read into life from my um, narrow experience. I've just lived this one portion of a lifetime. But David to me sometimes seems like the life of the party. He seems like the individual you want to have around. Not only did he have a cheerful disposition, not necessarily described even by himself. When they were saying, is there someone who can play for Saul to calm his bad moods? Oh, wait, I know a guy. Not only is he valiant, but he's skilled at playing. Oh, wait, the music at the party, right? And is he just kind of playing and he's not? No. He's kind of got words of wisdom, and he's got a mouth that can basically help encourage people in times of need, it would seem. So then if he is in the habit of being that kind of encouragement, how does he get to Psalm 109, where he's going to begin at verse 1, saying, Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate. They attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me. But I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. We talked about it in class this morning. There are times when I hear somebody's praying for me. If that's all they're going to do, that's all you're going to do to get in me to pray, bud? Whew. Keep reading. <laughs> I'm not going to read it. <laughs> We're not going to really preach this psalm this morning. He got it up there. You can read it right there. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about once again really is how David got there as I ask you to turn with me to Psalm, no, sorry, 1 Samuel 17. Uh, because the things that he's praying, uh, brother, I'm going to name him. Sam said, is this really an appropriate prayer? <laughs> At the end of class when I asked, is there anything else that folks would like to bring up? And I honestly don't necessarily know if it's an appropriate prayer, even though I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. They're like, no, you said, yeah. <laughs> And I say, yes, depending upon the situation. If you've been where David has been, I know when I first read through this, I was like, no, this does not sound like an appropriate prayer. But I had to realize I haven't been where David's been. I haven't been to the place that takes him from being the life of the party to wanting to pray this kind of thing against those who have been a problem for him. But I do know that if we look at his story, we might understand a little bit better that one phrase where he says in verse 4 of Psalm 109, no, sorry, in Psalm 109, in return, in return, because that's a pattern that we're going to see leading up to a very important point of David's life, where in Psalm, sorry, 1 Samuel 17, as David is bringing his brothers bread and cheese to the battlefield, he is basically greeting them as they are facing Goliath, taunting God's people, making fun of them for not being confident enough, even their best soldiers, to come out of their caves and at least face him. And so as David asks, okay, what will happen for the man of Israel who actually does stand up against Goliath? Verse 28 is going to read, Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? And if you've heard me talk very often, you've heard me say, <laughs> when he says, what have I done, that's one thing. But when he says, what have I done now, that kid's used to being somebody's scapegoat. And so when you look at Psalm 109, you are potentially looking at it from the perspective of someone who is used to being the one who gets blamed when things go wrong, whether or not it's true or not. He's in return from, I'm just bringing the bread and the cheese, bud. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> or is there something about David's presence? And they know, because by this time, it's rumored. Sometimes the rumors are good that David's a valiant man. And so if the run of the litter, I don't know how big he was, 
was, but if the youngest brother is confident enough to go ask the question, like he might actually do something, how does that make the older ones feel? And so the problem isn't so much David wanting to go watch a battle. You know how the story uh, plays out. He's getting ready to go fight the battle. There's something in his brother that knows this kid has a level of courage that I need right now. I'm the one that's supposed to be leading, but I'm scared about what he might do. (laughs) And understand, this young man does not sound like this is the first time he has been made the scapegoat. Well, how do we know? Even if it wasn't the first time or if it was the first time, it's not going to be the last. Why? Psalm, uh, sorry, 1 Samuel 18, as he has now joined Saul in his service, trying to help uh, essentially Um, ease some of Saul's suffering, Um, it's going to get him into a lot of trouble. Um, As verse 6 will say, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet so, sorry, to meet King Saul with tambourines and with songs of joy and with musical, sorry, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated the famous song. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry at this saying, sorry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can be, ha- sorry, and what more can he have but the kingdom? And saw I David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand and hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Understand, once again, in return for my love, Saul, you weren't any more courageous than everybody else who was scared and hiding in the caves, right? But you're the king. You're at least supposed to give us some ideas. You don't have to necessarily go fight the battle yourself. But here's David, the one who once again has provoked feelings of inadequacy in Saul because, well, now David's actually gotten it done. And not only has he gotten it done, they're assigning credit. Oh, what hurts even worse? It's one thing if they're just making it up, but they're kind of assigning credit where credit is due. And so in return for risking my life, Saul, sorry, David... <laughs> On behalf of Saul, is it really David's fault that Saul now has these feelings that he's taking out on, oh, wait, the scapegoat, sorry, David. And so now we're going to start to see a pattern where David is not simply uh, toting cheese and in response to that, uh, he's having to ask, what did I do now? And he's going to, to fight the battles uh, for the kingdom of Israel. And his return is, okay, well, what did I do now? Well, it's not done because he's going to have another bout. As, uh, the famous story goes on in verse 20. I'm sorry, verse 17. Well, Saul gets over it for a minute, long enough to promise his daughter's hand in marriage, but that didn't go so good either. Verse 17, then Saul said to David, here's my elder daughter, Merib. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And David said to Saul, who am I and who are my relatives and my father's clan in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, yeah, she was given to Adriel, the Maholothite, for a wife. Do I even need to, sometimes it just preaches itself, doesn't it? Right? And so it's not enough that you try to kill the guy for going to kill the the Philistine bully. Now it's the bait and switch. It's not even the bait and switch. At least Joseph knows, at least Jacob got the bait and switch. (laughs) David's getting the promise and nothing, right? And so now we got this, but is David now, okay, now it's time for me to square off against Saul. No, he forgives that. He's like, wait, wait, I got another daughter, Michal or Michael, and um, okay, we'll, we'll be at peace. If we can find it, but that's not going to create the peace. Why? Because it's not over for David. It's not over as we continue to turn forward in the story. Now it's pretty obvious as you get to verse 19, if you are, sorry, chapter 19. If you've got a subject heading, mine says Saul tries to kill David. So it's going to continue. And not only is Saul going to try to kill David, he is going to pursue him to the point where Jonathan, as much as he wants to believe that Saul is not going to kill David, in chapter 20, they're basically going to have a friendly discussion. And I don't think it got heated at all because it basically says uh, Jonathan and David, it seems like they love each other's, uh, sorry, each other as they love their own soul. But 
This is one of the points in the story that reminds me that sometimes it's good to have healthy disagreement be, uh, amongst friends. Why? Because Jonathan has access to Saul. And if there is going to be peace made in this situation, I love the way that Jonathan uses his platform. But sometimes his closeness and his proximity to Saul does not allow him to see Saul's true intentions. And so the disagreement is a healthy one because David realizes, wait, I'm the guy who's ducking the spears. But you're looking at this from a little bit different perspective. And so here's the thing. Not only are we disagreeing, we're disagreeing while you're sleeping good in the house, but I'm sleeping rough. I'm out in the field. And so every day you want to have hope that Saul's really going to turn this thing around, I'm getting rained on. And I'm trying to figure out how it is or where I'm going to sleep. And so as David's spending his time out in the field while Jonathan gets his answer, Jonathan finally acknowledges, okay, this is not a good situation. And so by the time you get to chapter 21, it's going to bring up the issue with David and the holy bread. As in verse 1, it's going to say, then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? This is a very tragic story where the priest is going to offer David assistance. Why? Because times in your life, when we went through this in the short lessons, we call this homeless king. Why? Because David is going through a period in his life that looks a whole lot like, if you know a lot about what homelessness looks like, it looks a lot like homelessness still looks today. He's sleeping outside, then he's going to the church for help. And when he can't go to the church for help, he's got to even go to his enemies to try to find help when that, ha when that doesn't work. Why? Because soon enough, he's going to be in Gath by the end of this chapter. Where's Gath? Oh, wait, where's Gath, y'all? We talked about it this morning. Okay, don't. Okay, don't. Gath is quite possibly where Goliath lived. And so he gets desperate to make it come full circle, meaning I can't find a place to rest amongst my friends or my family. So I'm desperate enough. I got to go to the enemy to see if I can just get a place to stay. And it's a lot like what homelessness begins to look like when you work with those communities, right? And so that's where David is now, and he's a homeless king. And at, at a certain point, um, not only does he um, end up being so uncomfortable with his situation because uh, he doesn't know whether or not he can even fully trust the priest. He's going to tell the priest a version of the story that's actually going to get the priest killed. And so understand how David is helping us to basically see how when we're under pressure, I say it from time to time, it's easy for me to make good decisions when y'all are watching, Right? I'm standing up here. I want to try to be impressive, right? And, well, this is when I'm at my best, and I still make mistakes. Oh, but don't let me get into a situation where I'm really under pressure, and it's lasting for a prolonged period of time. Now we got issues with my integrity as much as I preach integrity. Now we got issues with my courage as much as I try to preach courage. Now we got issues with all the things that I'm good at <laughs> in a vacuum <laughs> or in a safe space. And that's what David is helping us see now, how even a man after God's own heart falters. So how then can David go from a place where he's faltering in front of everybody to Psalm 109 once again? Hold on. God willing, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. In Psalm, or sorry, Mr. Page. At the end of, however, 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 21. That is where we're going to see him flee to his enemies in Gath. And David, in verse 10, and David arose and fled that day from Saul, and he went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to him, I'm oh, sorry, to one another of uh, him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior, sorry, he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? And we could cut it off there. The great giant slayer is now having to resort to trembling <laughs> to save his life. And I've said it before. Praise God for the moments where he does not leave me in a place where I think I'm just flying high. Praise God for times when he takes me from those moments when things are going super good to moments when I got to rely on him and the mercy of somebody who I might have, <laughs> might have, not willing no blood between, but might have some issues between that might make it really difficult for me to even speak to him, much less Ask them for my life. And so I praise God for those moments. Not like I used to. I used to just be embarrassing. Me? But God, I just did this. You've heard of it. Sophomore slump much? Yeah. 
So when things start off real well in a new endeavor, but after a while you start to stumble. And the reason why it becomes a term is because I think a few of us might have been through it before. And so God willing, as you grow older, you don't look at your sophomore slump as something God uses to embarrass you as much as he uses to help you remember, as we say from time to time. Uh, that he loves you and there are some responsibilities that he wants to trust you with that he wants to give to you and simply walk the other way not because he doesn't uh, love you and want to help you but because he trusts you just that much and so sometimes your sophomore slump is reminding you of what you still have left to be before God can trust you with that level of responsibility and so David seems here to be in his sophomore slump but it's going to lead to something that seems even worse okay well I couldn't um, the field wasn't comfortable uh, couldn't stay in the church for very long because Saul caught wind Doug the Edomite was there and I couldn't stay in Gath because I thought they might have been feeling a little bit more forgiving than they were uh, so now where do I go well chapter 22 verse 1 David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam and when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. That's the point at which it began to at least seem to turn around for David. What's a soldier or what's a general without an army? Well, it might not be the army you want, David, but it's the army you got. And it's going to prove to be a pretty good one. Why? Because sometimes you can have the most skilled soldiers available, but if their hearts aren't with you, good luck with that maybe, right? <laughs> it's called morale. <laughs> and so what David has here is a bunch of soldiers that might not be super trained, but they can identify with him on deep levels because this boy who was made the scapegoat now has an army full of scapegoats. So when you're in your sophomore slump, don't always look at that as a bad thing. Because God is sometimes exposing for you people who understand you on levels that you can't see on the surface. And so the people who are going to him now seem to be people who have been through some of what David has been through. And quite possibly in a time of battle will be willing to stick with him in places where the skilled soldiers might just be like, that's for you, bud. I don't know why we're here. And so even though these might not be the name soldiers, why, do you, why, why are most of the mighty men not available at this point? David's going to eventually have a, a whole bunch of mighty men. But Saul's picking them all up now because <laughs> he knows I wasn't so good at fighting for myself, so I'm going to get everybody I can who I know who can. But his army is going to be no comparison to an army that God is willing to bless, even if it seems ragtag. And so please continue on with me as we look because it's not over from there. It's not over from there. As you turn forward to chapter 24, 24, Saul is pursuing David. If you have a subject heading, it's going to say, David spares Saul's life. Well, how do we know he spares his life? Because he's still trying to kill him. And God delivers, him into, uh, delivers Saul into David's hands to see what he's going to do. And all that frustration still hasn't built up yet enough for David to say, now I'm about, no. He's still showing Saul mercy. But that sets the stage for a very important, uh, important story, one you're probably familiar with in chapter 25. Now uh, Samuel is going to pass on, and Saul's going to start to see the, the decline of, of his good years because now his counselor's gone. Whether he wanted to hear from him or not, he's going to start facing some times where he's going to need to hear from his counselor, and he's not going to be there. Verse 1, now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah, which is going to introduce the next story, the story of David and Abigail. Then David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man of Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the, man and his, I'm sorry, and the name of his wife was Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name, and thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house. Peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did not harm them, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, yet, I'm sorry, therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever 
you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Understand, when you are dealing with people who are used to being understated, you can't necessarily take them at their word for a good reason. See, there's a level of trust that we lose because sometimes when people want to inflate their accomplishments, but understated people are typically going to downplay what they've really sacrificed to hopefully try to help or intercede on your behalf. And so when David is saying none of your stuff was, was hurt, it's because David, in his time of struggle, was protecting somebody else's stuff. And so that man needs to be very careful how he answers David at this point. Because David is full. And remember, whether or not David has written Psalm 109 by this point, Psalm 109 is bubbling around in David's heart. And there are some things there. But here, Nabal would want David to feel like he was in a writing mood. He would want the Holy Spirit to fill him with the song. Because what's the opposite of saying a whole lot? It's saying very little. Because skip down to all the, we don't have to go through Nabal's response. And so David's young men in verse 12 turned away, came back, and told him all this, all the things that Nabal replied. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about, four, sorry, and about 400 men went up after David, while 200, men, sorry, 200 remained with the baggage. Did any of those men be like, David, what are, what are we about to do? Nabal's one guy. H how many people do you need for one guy? None of them asked the question. Why? Remember the army that God assembled around David. These are people who know what it's like to be scapegoated. They know what it's like to be disrespected at times when you're sacrificing. Try to make it easy for other people. And so don't think that they're just his lackeys because these same people are going to try to stone him when their wives get taken. Because David's going to get in a situation where in battle they don't leave enough people to watch those who were left behind. And in battle, everything they have are taken. And these same people, like it's, it's going to say, they're bitter in spirit. That bitterness cuts both ways. It can cause people to fight for you and want to die for you. It can also cause people to roll, on, or roll over and turn on you and want to make you the reason. Once again, <laughs> they know what it's like to be a scapegoat, but you'll become the scapegoat again. And so it's a very volatile situation when you have an army full of people who are dejected and despair and in a situation where, but in, as far as Nabal goes, they're like, no, we got you now. <laughs> Nobody's asking a word. Nobody's saying a thing. They trust them because they know what it's like. And so with that, uh, you know how the story ends. One person, once again, one person is able to step up and avert tragedy. Why? Because that whole concept, one of the reasons why this story meant something to me, is this whole concept of blind loyalty is just a thing now. I'm so sick of hearing about loyalty. Not because it's a bad thing. Loyalty to God is great. But it's the measurement by which we need to assess whether or not, like I said, as I said almost every week, nobody wants to be in the cult of Marcus. It's, trust me, I'll tell you, it's not a fun place to be. I make too many mistakes. I feel guilty having a cult which I guess is part of the disqualification for having a cult. You don't feel guilty about having it. But anyway, the bottom line is this, is ultimately when you're looking at uh, basically situations in, in which um, Nabal's household realizes the danger, it's because David is not the only person who has probably experienced what it's like to work for Nabal. Go look his name up. You know what his name means, right? Yeah, go... It'll tell you later on in the story. And so when these folks are hearing his response to David, they're like, no, no. When a man says, just go ask them, don't, 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 don't ask me, because I might be biased. I might want to inflate. I might want to puff. Ask them what really happened. When those men are carrying back the story that, no, nothing happened. We felt safe. We felt secure. You ever had a sleepless night? I have. <laughs> these men don't seem like they had any sleepless nights when David's around. And so when they hear the way that Nabal responds, they're like, we know that there's trouble because David's nice, but I don't have to read Psalm 109 to know everybody's got a point. And so in wisdom, it's not just Abigail who understands the danger. How does Abigail even find out? Was she there? No, the rest of the scapegoats, I'm sorry, the rest of the servants understood the danger in the situation, and they said, we are all in trouble. Loyalty has limits. See, because what happened is no matter how loyal they want to be to Nabal, the reality is, the reality is, 
he was disrespectful he was disrespectful to a man who was used to being maybe from their perspective they understood disrespected i'll tell tell like this i'm going to tell the story but i say that every other week if not every week all right when i was overseas there are very few coffee shops because it's just a different place and so being an american i was craving coffee and there was this one coffee shop in town and i grew to grew sorry grew to bond with its owner because once again he was from a different part of the world but he um left uh, wherever he was from, I'm not going to say because I want to identify him too too closely. He um, left his part of the world to start a second business and basically um, go into the second stage of his life, relaxing a little bit more than he was able to in the first half. And so as he opened this coffee shop, it didn't take long before it became popular. By the time I got there, it was a nice spot to be. But he had this constant struggle trying to help people who didn't understand the need for a coffee shop, why it might be a good idea in a tourist town where people from all over the world were passing by to have at least one spot where they can go get coffee. But if you've never grown up in a place where you can afford the cup of coffee because it costs what you would basically pay for your entire dinner, people aren't going to run the business with the perspective you have. And so what happened was over time, he got super frustrated. And there was this tension that built up between he and the people who were working for him. And even though we were friends, I would see the way that he would talk to his staff. And I would say, buddy, I'm more like you in the sense that, yes, we both come from a different place and we have probably more resources than most of the folks here. But I grew up like them. And this is the one thing you want to be sure to be careful of when you're talking to poor people. Money doesn't mean the same thing to, I'll say us. I can't say us the same way that they could. Because when you grow up without, respect tends to compensate for what you lack in resources. And you are in a very volatile situation right now because you're disrespecting poor people. And that's all they've ever known. And so what eventually ended up happening was it wasn't like what we have here where sometimes you run the risk of having spree shootings and that's not to be made light of because one just hit very close to home for me. And that's a story I'm not going to tell. Um, but ultimately what happened was the young woman who he had running the establishment for him, um, very open, one of the reasons why he was okay to leave the country that he had come from is because he was now living openly with his mistress. And he had set her up to run the business. But the thing was, she had come from a previous life. And because he thought that she would so be so afraid of going back to the life that she used to live, that she would do no matter, she would do whatever he said, no matter how he talked to her or how he talked to his staff, then over time he got the, into the habit of disrespecting them all to the point where I was like, brother, you're in a very volatile situation. And eventually what happened was, one day I went to go to my coffee shop and it was closed down. But I got a chance to talk to my friend, and I got a chance after that many years of him being able to have that successful business, essentially taking his confession. We don't take confessions in the churches of Christ um, like most people do or you would see in the Catholic church. But one of the things he said was, Marcus, she slept with everyone. And the reason why I mention that is because money doesn't mean the same thing to people who come from nothing. If you take them with the money that you've given them, back to a place where they feel like nothing, you would be shocked at the things that will happen. He lost his business, he lost his name in the community, and he left and never came back. I ended up leaving too, but it was a lesson that the scapegoats feel one another and they understand one another and that would have never happened if she were the only one he were tr was treating that way. It wouldn't have happened if they couldn't have empathized with what was going on in that situation. All the money he was giving them couldn't fix the fact that these folks were like, we'll go get another job. <laughs> but ultimately what's happening is we need to fix this relationship. And so when David is writing Psalm 109, understand, that's his way of expressing what that young woman did when she went back to the life that she knew, uh, when her, her benefactor thought that that could never happen. Understand that Psalm 109 doesn't always manifest itself in an act of violence. Why? Because David's a wise man, and Abigail helped save him from what? Blood guilt. Because he doesn't act. But does that mean the story was over? No. What ends up happening is, here's the more dangerous situation. It's not pushing a person to the point in which they will act on their own behalf. It's pushing them to the point where God is more angry about the situation than you realize. That's the danger of this situation. Why? Because you know how it plays out. 
God is able to surgically deal with the situation that David was about to club and basically incur blood guilt because of. Out of all of the killing that David had done to this point, David was about to commit an act that would have probably gotten him significant judgment from God. Abigail saves him from that. Those servants save him from that. God steps in and takes care of the problem for him anyway. Now please look, at me, look with me at the end of Psalm 109 to understand his wisdom at this point. Even though we won't read the rest of the psalm, he'll end up his list of rather harsh judgments or harsh things that he's praying for that happened to his accusers. He'll say in verse 20, may this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, those who speak ill against my life. But in verse 27, let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Ultimately, told the young people this morning, um, I wish I have uh, lived a life where I was never provoked to the point where I pray a curse or ask God to execute a curse on anybody. But I've done that. See, one of the things that God has helped me see is, once again, when I'm, I'm, I'm preaching up here how fair he is, he's super fair. How do I know? Well, I read it, but it's nothing like a lesson earned. Or Yeah, a lesson earned is a lesson learned. Those times when I prayed that prayer, but the next thing that happened in my life was super similar to the vengeance I prayed against. Yeah. And so that's when I started to understand that passage about when, when, when they curse, you bless. That's, that sounds silly, but that's biblical <laughs> because God is fair. And when my anger is boiling, I don't remember that as much as I remember what was done to me. And so sometimes God might simply be saying, brother, <laughs> he's not brother, he's father, son, <laughs> don't force my hand <laughs> in ways you don't understand. And so David's wisdom at this point, hopefully, maybe having learned from his experience with Abigail, is at this point understanding the way in which there is wisdom in trying to pray a certain degree of uh, room into whatever I'm feeling in the way of grievance, room for God to act. How do we know? Because by the time you get to Psalm 110, that's all it is. And it's a heartbreaking psalm in some ways. Uh, hopefully it will come, uh, will come clear in, in, in just a few verses. Psalm 110 as we close. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations. Filling them with corpses, he will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. And why is that so tragic? That sounds like that's a triumph. No, that's a triumph for somebody else. David's not a priest. He's a king. There were kings who got in a whole lot of trouble for trying to become priests. And so this is one of those moments where David is getting good news for somebody else. And understand in life, one of the things I had to start to realize is there's some things that may just pass me by. I say it from time to time. There's some things that in life are just going to pass me by. It may never be my moment. It may never be my time to realize everything that I've allowed to, allowed my heart to desire, whatever. Okay, you got it. Everything I, des I want. It's not the way life is designed. But see, sometimes when I have legitimate desires, things that I want that are okay. I become happier as I mature when I'm able to see God deliver that to other people and find joy in their success. That's one of the advantages of having a body. It's not simply the additional skill set. It's there are some joys that God has never allotted for me here that I can still experience if I'm happy for you. I used to preach it probably too much at Pullman, so I apologize for the redundancy on that one, but, um, but it's magnifying my joy. We talk about a, in terms of business, how do you scale the business? You take a great th thing, McDonald's back in the day, and you find a way to scale it and take it global. Well, if they know how to do that with money, I think God has taught us how to do that with happiness, <laughs> if we learn to genuinely be happy for one another. 
I don't have to fixate on what I lack if I'm genuinely happy for you. And so I may live and die as a scapegoat, but to the degree I see in you the fact that you have overcome that situation in life and you are now able to find joy too, I am happy for you <laughs> because you encourage me that God is not asleep. <laughs> he is not ignoring us. He just has a different path for me. That path may be later. It may be never. But I trust that at some point, Melchizedek <laughs> is waiting <laughs> to reward me with something that's going to make this seem like it was worth it. And so when we ask, how did David get to this point? I don't know. <laughs> But I do realize that there is this principle they call the thin skull rule in, in practicing law. And what they say is you take your victim as you found them. So you don't get to say, push somebody over, have them fall, hit their head and die and say, oh, I didn't mean it. No, that's that's murder time, bud. At least second, right? <laughs> What's numbered in this state? That's second degree murder or manslaughter at the least. But you have to understand that people come to us with different levels of uh, baggage and wounding already equipped. And we don't necessarily know what we're seeing, once again, behind the surface. And so that's one of the reasons why God tells us, don't push in the first place, but unless you're sure that's something I told you to do. Because you don't necessarily know what condition you're finding your victim in. And God is still going to hold us accountable for the damage we do even when we don't intend it. Why? Because there's certain habits that I might have gotten into. This is, well, why is it fair that I push this one and they die and somebody else pushes this one and it's just, you know, just, it's over. Well, God understands also the habits that I've gotten into. The things that he's tried to get me to stop in the past. The things that I've refused to accept his counsel on. And sometimes he will bring me someone who he is ready to intervene on behalf of. And once again, like we said, the danger isn't that person getting even with me. The danger is me coming across somebody who God is willing to fight for. In a time of life when I've refused to stop the things he's warned me could cause trouble. And so my prayer for each of us in looking at Psalm 109, me admittedly tiptoeing around most of the uglier parts of <laughs> the subject, is that God willing, we understand why God, when he's asking us to pay attention to certain things, stop certain things. And as we often say now, try to be an encouragement. I appreciate y'all reminding me of that because y'all know me. I apologize to the elders this morning because I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> um, I forgot what I was going to say after the confession. <laughs> but bottom line is, um, we all have these, these moments where we get to in life where if you don't want to admit that you want to pray Psalm 109 against somebody, maybe just think again and have God remind you. And so God willing, the, the, the value in seeing David get to a point like this in the Psalm 109 is he is helping us understand that if we haven't gotten to that point yet in our lives, God willing, help us get to the point where we get to see people who... First of all, we're curious to know and understand a little bit better. That's the, the part of a family. Um, I, I had somebody um, ask me about this week. Well, wh what about that part in, in the church about family? They had been picking a congregation in a different part of, of the state. Um, and I was trying to convince them, maybe come, come visit here. And they were like, no, one of the reasons why I'm um, trying to find a new congregation is I'm trying to find a place where people are actually involved in one another's lives in healthy ways. And so one of the things that God can help us to do as we begin to get involved in one another's lives is remember, God willing, to do that in healthy ways. So that we can, God willing, get to the point where we're asking people enough about themselves to understand um, some of the red flags we might see for somebody who's been used to being scapegoated. Somebody who's taking responsibility just over and over out of habit because that's the role they're used to filling in their family. Somebody who's used to taking responsibility over and over when it's not their fault because that's the role they're used to filling in their jobs. Someone who's used to taking responsibility over and over, fill in the blank. So that we are wise in the way that we approach people in our family who filled roles that we might quite possibly not be able to relate to, right? And so God willing, when we find people like that in the cave, it can look like more like David's reunion in the cave. Because before all those um, dejected and bitter people came to David, guess what happened? That brother who was questioning him early on, why are you here? They had a reunion. 
And so that to me is what part of the value in this story is. When you can start to recognize Psalm 109 people, then you can start to build bridges, not just with friends, but maybe help them heal relationships with family that have been strained over the years. And all that's to say, God just give us the wisdom and the love to draw closer to one another in ways that actually heal as we together stand and sing.